Today on the Tech Bytes podcast, we're talking DDoS mitigation. In particular, we're going to look at how stateful firewalls and other devices are vulnerable to DDoS due to TCP state exhaustion attacks. Our sponsor today is NetScout, and our guest is Roland Dobbins. He is a principal engineer at NetScout. He's going to walk us through how the attack works and what can be done to mitigate DDoS attacks that use this technique. Roland, welcome to the podcast, and let's dive right in. So what is it about stateful firewalls that make them vulnerable to DDoS? Sure. Thanks for having me here. DDoS attacks are actually attacks against capacity and or state. And so what do we mean by that? Very specifically, if there is a form of state, whether it's in a network infrastructure device like a stateful firewall or a stateful load balancer, whether it's in an application stack, um, it is very easy for the attackers to programmatically exhaust that state. The asymmetry of resources in DDoS attacks is generally very, very heavily in favor of the attackers because they are using stolen resources, right? So it's essentially free for them. All they're spending is their time. And Mm. so uh, they are often able to overwhelm the state tables in these devices. And how does that work? With a stateful firewall, when an incoming packet from, quote, the outside, unquote, hits that stateful firewall, the stateful firewall will then do a lookup in its state table to say, do I have an outbound connection that corresponds to this incoming packet? And if the answer is yes, then it, then it allows that, that packet through. The answer is no, it drops it. The problem comes in when we put stateful firewalls where they don't belong. Stateful firewalls have a big, important role to play in front of eyeball networks, access networks where there are human beings uh, that are that are clients essentially accessing servers. But in front of a server in almost every kind of server you can think of, every single incoming connection to that server is unsolicited. Therefore, there is no state to inspect. And so what we often see is that when stateful firewalls have suboptimally been placed in front of servers and there is no um, DDoS mitigation protection for those stateful firewalls themselves, the attackers are able to send enough traffic that causes enough continuous lookup churn uh, in the state table of those stateful firewalls and causes them to fa- uh, either either they program they track they crowd out the the yeah. legitimate traffic with with programmatically generated attack traffic or they cause a device to exhaust a CPU and fall over and that causes a big outage and that's really interesting now when we prepared for this year you told me this and you said that um, you find that a surprising number of engineers in the community are not aware that state exhaustion is a major trauma zone. Now, I'm going to admit that I've been working in applications layer of the network for 25 years, and it was one of the things I learned very, very early on. But I then went to Twitter when we talked about this and asked, and turns out it's actually a real thing. A lot of customers are not aware (laughs) that firewalls have a memory and it fills up with every with every flow that moves across the firewall. There's a state. There's that that state is recorded and then tracked. And with application firewalls, this is much uh, the load is much higher because the CPU is doing much more inspection. It has to hold a lot more data and metadata. Has to hold a threat table. Has to do the comparison. So if you're Um, next generation firewall is under attack, under DDoS style attack, where it's doing application level. The load doesn't just increase, it exponentially increases and the device collapses and often collapses disastrously, right? That's exactly right. And the attackers know this. And so especially the more sophisticated attackers who perform pre-attack reconnaissance, they will identify stateful Mm -hmm. devices in the application and service delivery chain, like stateful firewalls, like load balancers and things of this nature. And so they'll attack it in such a way that that the the synthetically generated attack traffic is crafted to maximally exhaust state. And so um, we see this in many cases where we get a call and we're, you know, here, help, help, the internet's down, the entire data center's down. And so you'll have an entire data center of servers performing various vital functions like, you know, authoritative DNS, recursive DNS, web servers, um, session border controllers, you name it. And the entire thing um, has been knocked over by these attacks. And it's a, it's, it's a physics problem. And it's not anything that has to do with a particular yeah. brand or manufacturer or model. It's just the, the fact is that these devices have limited capabilities and the biggest, baddest one 
one you can buy or build, attackers can uh, cause issues with it. And even if it has some special controls that mm. are designed to try to limit um, the ability of the attacker to knock it over, still the programmatically generated attack traffic will squeeze out the legitimate traffic and still cause an outage. And one of the key things here is that people will actually go and buy overspec firewalls to cope with that. They say like, well, I've got a, a hundred megs of internet or a gigabit or a 10 gigabits of bandwidth, but I can easily be DDoS. So what I'll do is I'll go and buy a hundred gigabits of bandwidth. And now I have to buy a firewall, which does a hundred gigabits per second, but you might only be pulling two, three, four gigabits of traffic. So now all of a sudden you're paying for unwasted bandwidth that you probably don't ever use and firewall capacity, which is not cheap. And I think part of what you're saying here is part of the NetScout um, DDoS service is that you can actually save money by having a DDoS so that you don't over-specify your infrastructure. Well, that's very true. And of course, another aspect that is often not understood is about DDoS attacks are not just about bandwidth, they can be about throughput or packets per second, connections per second, transactions per second. And so in many cases, especially these state exhaustion attacks, the bits per second is not the important metric, it's the number of packets per second, and then then the the diversity of those packets in terms of yeah. source address, destination address, and all, all that kind of stuff. What we do at NetScout is we do a couple of different things. First of mm -hmm. all, we produce solutions that detect allow operators to detect, classify, trace back, and mitigate DDoS attacks. And we make them for the enterprise as well as for service providers. Uh, and we actually have a hybrid approach where an enterprise can deploy an intelligent DDoS mitigation system like our AED on their premise. They can mm. configure it and uh, they can, they can um, enable the, the countermeasures that are situationally appropriate to protect the types of servers that they have. And then they can link that. They can contract for a commercial DDoS mitigation service that is all also powered uh, by NetScout solutions, and those solutions can talk to each other. And so the benefit here is that if they have moves, ads, and changes, they can keep their local mitigation uh, system up to date. They can have uh, always on uh, mitigation. So when they receive an attack, it is instantly mitigated uh, by the on-premise AED device. And if the levels of DDoS uh, attack traffic rise uh, above what can be, can, can be supported by the link, the AED will actually signal up Upstream to its its uh, big siblings uh, uh, in the in the cloud based or upstream DDoS mitigation service, which will then take over and carry that heavier load. So what you're doing there is you're actually got a split DDoS mitigation strategy or a dual approach, if you want to use sort of different words. So you can ha have an on premise unit which sits in front of your boxes and that's inside of your domain of control, and you can do whatever. And then you've got the tr the more traditional approach where somewhere in the network in the internet, you, uh, right. you have a bunch of infrastructure which can filter upstream, so that should you get to the point where you're getting a mass like a massive denial of service attack, you can actually mitigate it in the network so that your pipe doesn't get swamped. But if you're getting an application okay. level attack, which is a different type of DDoS, right? Then you probably want to do that on-prem where you can tailor the response much more tightly. Well, you can tell it a response tightly in either situation, but yes, that hi mm. that that hybrid model is the model that that our customers tend to go for because they want to have that control, and of course, they're going to have more knowledge of their applications and things like connections per second, transactions per second, you know, extranet partners that they routinely exchange data with versus their general customer base, uh, and and those different types types of, of properties. The the layer seven mitigation, application layer mitigation, can take place in the cloud as well. But you're exactly right in that. The thinking is that having local autonomy, local control there is great. And it also gives them the choice of mitigation service provider because uh, we at Nescout have been in the DDoS mitigation business for 20 years. We have been in this business longer than any other company in the space. We're the leaders in the space. Um, mm -hmm. We invented the concept of commercial DDoS mitigation services. And most of the high profile commercial DDoS mitigation services in the world are powered with our technology. And bringing this back to the state issue, our countermeasures, our protections are designed explicitly either to be completely stateless in nature, or if they do need to carry uh, a small amount of state in order to do things like, for example, determine if a client candidate is a real client versus a bot, they carry a small amount of state, ephemeral state, and they shed that state very quickly. So the solution itself, number one, cannot be overwhelmed from a state perspective. And number two, if there are things like stateful firewalls or stateful load balancers devices that are in engineered into the yeah. in, in customer infrastructure, we can protect 
those devices just as will protect servers themselves. So what you're alluding to there is it's not just firewalls that can run out of state exhaustion, it's also load balancers, IDSs, IPSs. So if you can overload your threat detection solution and your threat visibility tools, then you might be able to sneak something in the back door. So it becomes a security issue as well. Um, That's and exactly the second, right. And I can yeah. give you an example of that if you would like. Yeah, sure. um, yeah, yeah. So I've been able to take uh, an application layer. Uh, just, this is not actually a bot, it's a DDoS generation tool called HOIC, HOIC. And I was able to use it to overwhelm a 10 gig uh, hardware based load balancer. And it didn't take me 600 million packets per second to do that. It didn't take me 60 million packets per second. It didn't take 6 million packets per second. It didn't take 600,000 packets per second. It didn't take 60,000 packets per second. It only took me 6 thousand packets per second of Hoyt to overwhelm the state table in that mm -hmm. very expensive commercial load balancer and send it into a 45 minute reboot cycle. Now, just so the listeners are, understand the context here, I can generate more than 6,000 packets per second with my smartwatch. <laughs> yeah. Well, the second thing that I want to highlight to people here is that DDoS attacks can are partly about packets per second, but they're also about flows per second. So they can actually be an attack at, at the UDP layer or the TCP layer. You can have a flood attack at the IP layer. But these days, it's much more common to have a layer seven attack where you do, say, for example, open up 10,000 HTTP flows. And you can open up almost an unlimited number of HTTP sessions with a server through a firewall with just a very few packets. Uh, look at D DNS reflection attacks, for example. That And that is something right. that, you know, if you're not thinking about those sorts of things, you're probably going to find out the hard way at some point in the future. <laughs> That's right. That, that's part of that's part of capacity engineering and resilience. And so it's very important that whenever an organization has public facing properties that are vital to its business, to its mission, and, and what organization doesn't have those things like VPN concentrators, for example, you know, you, you name it, right? Um, they have to be engineered in such a way that they are in and of themselves are resilient. If they have self-protection mechanisms, those need to be enabled. And then they have to be protected by solutions that are specifically engineered engineered to, to protect them against the type of DDoS attack traffic that you're talking about. Because again, those sophisticated attackers know how to generate attack traffic that is designed to, to overwhelm the, the natural capacities and the, the actual um, traffic model and, uh, and capacities that these devices um, typically are, are designed and configured and deployed with. And so that's why it's really important, number one, to have complete visibility edge to edge and all the traffic that's ingressing, egressing, and traversing your network. And number two, understand the all the characteristics of the things that you are protecting, uh, because that is the metier um, of, of DDoS uh, mitigation or DDoS defense, is understanding what you're protecting and then configuring your mitigation system and your countermeasures and protections in a situationally appropriate way so that they, they are optimized to protect those servers and services and applications mm -hmm. and the ancillary supporting infrastructure. So I want to make sure I understand how your device, the AD device that sits uh, in front of my infrastructure and is intercepting mm -hmm. uh, this traffic uh, doesn't isn't also susceptible to stateful attacks because I assume it has to do some kind of analysis or inspection or make a decision about each packet coming in and how does so how does it do that without being susceptible to a stateful resource exhaustion? Right. So the device itself, the AED in scale, we have capacities all the way in the hundreds of gigabits per second. Uh, it's a layer two device that is typically deployed just southbound of the internet transit router, the router that links to the upstream internet providers and, and then northbound of, of the rest of the, the, you know, the servers and load balancers and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And so, first of all, the device uh, reports and, and tabulates on traffic that's passing through it inbound and outbound. Secondly, again, um, what, what we do is we take a look at the servers and services and applications that are being protected. And we have different types of countermeasures. Many of them are stateless. Uh, as I noted, some of them uh, are metered countermeasures, things like packets per second, connections per second, requests per second, things of that nature. And some of them are interactive, where again, the system will, will interact um, with a given um, uh, client candidate, a source to determine if it appears to be illegitimate or, or not. And so some of those countermeasures are actually um, mm -hmm. designed in, in, a, in an allowance 
mode where they will specifically allow sources that pass the test, but otherwise they're just not going to allow anything through. Uh, and they also, because those countermeasures are specifically crafted to protect the different types of servers, services and, and applications on those servers, the different countermeasures are not look, looking, each countermeasure is not looking at every single packet. They're looking at the pertinent packets. Now, as a mm. whole, we absolutely do inspect and, and, and provide for, you know, uh, forwarding or drop decisions for individual packets. We also, when we identify sources that are misbehaving, we will then, we have the options to drop all packets from those sources um, yeah. um, for the duration of the attack, you know, for forever or for a certain period of time. And so these are different mechanisms that we've employed to ensure that we don't carry a lot of state. The state that we carry is very brief, like when we make an, you know, an evaluation decision uh, about a given source, and then we move on uh, to, to all the others. And so we've never had an instance in which our devices have been overwhelmed. And in fact, we have um, a, a great track record of protecting stateful devices that can be overwhelmed uh, by these types of attacks with our solution. Well, we're running out of time, uh, but th th there could be so much more to this discussion. Is there anything you want to leave us with, Roland, uh, as we wrap up? Sure. Organizations need to understand that uh, any organization can, in fact, be targeted by DDoS attacks, either directly or indirectly as a form of collateral, uh, collateral impact. And so it's very important that when we take a look at security, that we, we obviously should pay attention to confidentiality and integrity. And we also must pay attention to availability. It has to be paramount um, in, 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 in nature. And so mm -hmm. when we're designing the applications and the services and the delivery infrastructure, we have to design them with state minimization in mind, and then we have to ensure that DDoS mitigation solutions are deployed, which can protect against all different types of DDoS attacks, including state exhaustion DDoS attacks. Fantastic. And if you want to find out more about the product Roland had talked about, you can go to netscout.com slash protect firewall. That's netscout.com slash protect protect firewall. Uh, that is the end of our time. Thank you, Roland, for joining us. And thanks to NetScout for being a sponsor. And as always, thanks to you for being a listener. And you can find this and many more fine, free technical podcasts along with our community blog. It's all at packetpushers.net. You can follow us on Twitter at Packet Pushers. Find us on LinkedIn and rate us on Apple Podcasts. And last but not least, always remember that too much networking would never be enough.